The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Good morning, body. Morning, guys. Everybody GM to body in the chat. This guy gets up extra early compared to us to do the show. <laughs> uh, uh, just one hour. After the time change, it, it only it only became one hour. So. Oh. And yes, yeah. good morning, GM, GM, GM. Control V, Control V, Control V. <laughs> How's it How going? How you guys doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Just hectic day. How you doing? Good. Okay. Still, um, still struggling with some, you know, technical issues over here. But uh, one of us kind of, yeah. It's, and sometimes when you start messing with stuff, weird things happen, and then it's just like, then I lost. Believe it or not, I lost a bunch of data. Not too much because it was Christmas, but um, oh, it's my own fault for not doing some good backups. Uh -oh. Bro, ZFS like v ZFS screwed me. I, I don't know what happened. Probably I just did something wrong, you know, late at night on not enough sleep. But um, it overrode a whole bunch of stuff in a very weird way, uh, in a really weird way. So that's funny because I was just about to say jokingly that RAID is not a backup, but I guess you were using uh, some sort of Z RAID. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it is a backup, kind of like for a hard drive failure, sure. Um, Especially with snapshots, like, okay, I deleted some files on accident that I didn't want to. Okay, let me roll back. I can get those. You don't even need to roll back. You just go into the different folder. It's great for that, but true backups should live at least on a different hard drive, and they shouldn't be tied to your current RAID setup. You should, like, basically have to manually press a button that says, send this data to this other location that has nothing to do with, um, ideally, in a different box, but... Um, you know, at least in a different hard drive on your same box that has nothing to do with your other hard drives. But uh, do you actually you know, delete something, or was it because of there were some uh, some weird bugs in ZFS recently that was causing data corruption that are fixed now? Um, may, maybe it was one of those bugs. I don't know. I was trying to back up. Um, basically, I was trying to back up a set of virtual machines or jails, really, and I sent um, a whole data set to my backup. Uh, really, I should say, you know how you separate your your root data from your user data? Well, I sent the root data to the user data, and I told it to live in a completely different location. But then it overwrote all of my or a lot of my data from like my user data, and I couldn't like I just couldn't for the life of me understand how it would do that. Um, and it didn't make any sense that it that it should have done that. Maybe I mispressed a key, but usually ZFS refuses to overwrite. Um, incremental snapshots unless everything is just absolutely perfect. So I don't know how it managed to do that. Maybe I just, you know, I, I hit the magical sequence that would tell it to overwrite everything, but it shouldn't have done that. So luckily it was just over Christmas um, and I had other backups that was a month old. So I've lost, eh, I've lost a little bit of data. It's not really so much the data, it's the progress on some of the stuff I'm working on. So yeah, whatever. It'll teach me to get better backups. Ah, oh, this is unfortunate. Uh, maybe you got a little little drunk over the Christmas time, you know, just decided to delete some data for fun. <laughs> you know, I wish I could at least have that excuse. I was like totally sober. Um, it was a little bit late, but it wasn't that late. So I don't know. Whatever. Hopefully, that's why if my voice sounds different, I don't have a VM up and running, so I don't have my regular microphone. And for whatever reason, my Google Pixel today or my graphene was like, "No, I will not accept your microphone uh, as an input." So I, I couldn't even use my, my regular headset. So I'm just on my, like, I'm just using the cell phone mic today. Yeah. All right. Well. All right, man. Well, another big week in, in price. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the ETS finally got approved. Um, we were expecting this. And let's go to the Bitcoin chart here. We were also like, we had talked about like, hey, this might not be super positive for Bitcoin, right? This might not necessarily be, you know, mega pump action. Like, okay, we got a little bit of upside. Um, when was that approval? It was on Wednesday, which would have been right about, yeah, right here. So how much pump did we get? <laughs> we got about 11% pump, um, which is not too unsurprising. That's about the same amount of pump as we got back in uh, October 15th, 2021. Um, way back here scroll back a little bit 
Yeah, this was uh, this vertical line right here. That was the pump. Um, uh, that was the day that the, the futures ETF was approved. And um, it took a few days, but we got about 15%. Um, in this case, we got basically all of that 15%. Ah, no, it took a few days as well. Uh, 12% really. Okay, so as we talked about, um, the thing that I thought was going to be more bullish on the Bitcoin ETF was actually Ethereum, because Ethereum's next, right? Ethereum is the next um, pivot. Now, maybe there'll have to be a whole bunch of fights and court battles and this and that. Maybe that'll have to happen, but what's important is the hype cycle. Bitcoin, basically, its price already includes the speculation on the ETF. This was a not a, um, a buy the rumor, sell the news, but it was a buy the rumor, pivot the news kind of event. You'll notice that Ethereum is still green, like th Ethereum is still going up. So uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, that's Sunday. Oh, this is the three day chart. That's why it looks odd. There we go. Friday, Thursday, Wednesday. Yeah, so Ethereum pumped on Wednesday with Bitcoin as well. Um, it pumped 15%, but it's still higher. Like currently it's still significantly higher. And you can see in the Ethereum versus Bitcoin chart, uh, it basically bounced up off of that off of that line. So I think in a lot of ways, like this lower line and touching it, touching it, touching it was a little bit of a fake out. That wick, um, we talked about that if this thing comes back to the upside here and stays here, we're going to probably look at that wick and say that that was a hammer, that was a bottoming kind of sign. Um, obviously, things can change, right? Um, new cycles can change. But for the moment, um, I would I would be rotating like I would have rotated from Bitcoin to ETH. If I held any Bitcoin, um, I guess I hold a little bit, but mostly just for um, just for nostalgia. No, I'm just kidding. I, just for practicality. <laughs> um, say what's up as a collectible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I have, you know, maybe I have a Bitcoin NFT. Maybe I don't. Who knows? Um, maybe I drop some degeneracy onto the chain. Maybe I maybe I have people. Maybe I paid some other people to do that for me. We'll never know. Mm -mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, Right now, you know, you really don't hold Bitcoin as like a, you know, as a hedge or something. You don't, it's not a really significant in your portfolio. Uh, it depends from time to time. I can have um, a, signi a significant amount of Bitcoin. Um, typically, it'll be wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum um, because that way I don't have to use some centralized instant exchange or KYC bullshit to get Bitcoin exposure, right? I can just get Bitcoin exposure on Ethereum. Uh, which is funny, you know, because how does everyone use Bitcoin custodially? And technically that wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum has a custodian. So, um, I mean, it's been many years. I don't see any reason why they would just rug pull. That would be stupid. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not hodling that way. That's not, I'm not like, Hey, this is my life savings, <laughs> you know, uh, as wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. It's like, Hey, I think Bitcoin will outperform for the meantime. I'm going to take a Bitcoin position and, uh, and then I can get in and out on Ethereum, you know, no, no big deal. Like trustlessly, they can't stop me. Um, all of those good things that we like, not private, but um, hopefully my, hopefully I've done the work necessary to anonymize my Ethereum stack, um, which uh, for all the Fed boys listening does not include having touched Tornado Cash now in the past or ever. Uh, you know, I, I promise I won't be a bad boy. Um, I'll just use the better solution, uh, which is Monero and chain hopping, which they also say is bad boy territory, but not elite. So, um, <laughs> yeah, not yet. Imagine, imagine them trying to make chain hopping illegal. That would that would just be special. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, the altcoins. See which ones are are pumping. Ah, here here you go. ETH um, ETH is in, is in gray, and ETH has pumped uh, really more than anything. Um, XMR has actually kind of uh, done pretty bad lately. Ever since um, ever since the announcement of, or relatively speaking, it's done worse ever since the announcement of the the delistings, um, which we really hope that they'll just uh, you know quit fucking around and. Uh, quit teasing us and actually do. They probably won't. They probably can't, not without pumping the price. Um, let's see what else here is doing good. Looks like TRX has taken a pump. Um, oddly enough, I do think TRX will do probably pretty decent good. Um, they're they're uh, an EVM chain, and Tether is used a shitload of Tether on top of Tron. So, um, and then obviously, you know, you've got all the degeneracy and the memes and the and the tokens and everything and. Um, that 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 can all be done on Tron just as well as on Ethereum. It's kind of like, it's like Tron is like Ethereum's Litecoin. You could think of it that way. Basically, just a copy paste um, that's a little bit cheaper to to do stuff. So um, yeah, that's what the that's what the altcoins look like. Uh, I'll leave that up there in case any of you guys want to take a little bit harder look at that. Um, you'll notice Bitcoin dominance here. Uh, Bitcoin dominance has um, kind of vacillated, oscillated a little bit, um, but this is. 
this action, like, okay, it went down, it tried to get back into this rising wedge, it failed again. Um, this action makes you think, all right, the you're this is not the kind of rising wedge that's about to break to the upside and and the utopia of Bitcoin hyper hyper Bitcoinization is, you know, <laughs> hyper Bitcoinization in this case would just be getting back to like 70%. <laughs> <laughs> they would they would love to just try and get back to the last bear market and they can't even do that um and yes I, i'll i'll probably spend oh many months and even years trolling bitcoin maximalists from here on out um as as things just continue to turn the, a direction that they didn't think and probably this etf in hindsight probably this etf approval will um will stand out for a lot of them as like something significant happened in the year of 2023 um across a number of different domains and the etf was like the highlighting pivot point they'll probably they'll probably make a bunch of after the fact excuses and uh you know i'll still be there trolling them um hopefully with the rest of my bros here um so let's take a look at monero uh, monero has done a little bit of a rebound slightly slightly um after coming down to about 144. um so yeah i mean you'll notice that these lower standard deviation bands the orange bands uh really really that they've been a pretty good spot um uh hang on a second there we go. They've been a pretty good spot to just expect um, bottoming action. Um, this is just really, really stable price action. In fact, um, these are this is this is um, this is what is known as like a compression of volatility. At the moment, the upper standard deviation bands continue to trend downwards, and the lower standard deviation bands continue to trend upwards. So, what it means is that the volatility that Monero has been experiencing over the past number of years um, has been decreasing. Typically, this acts as a spring. At some point, volatility will compress enough. The price will stabilize to something that people think, hey, this is the fair price of the asset. And, um, <clears throat> and then a new speculation round will emerge. Typically, that'll be associated with other macro kinds of events. Um, but as volatility compresses and the price like stops moving, eventually it'll bounce to one direction. It'll start moving that direction. And then the volatility bands, again, the green and the orange bands, the standard deviation bands, also called volatility bands, will start to curl in the direction that it's moving. And then price will actually trend on the upside of those bands as they continue moving up. And typically, that's a major macro move that happens. So um, it would be difficult to say, you know, exactly when this happens. Um, maybe we can let me bring up uh, there. So there's another chart that I have that um, that just plots the the distance between these standard deviations okay that's what these blue bands are these blue bands tell you what is what's the distance between the upper and the lower standard deviation across multiple different timelines so we'll go to the logarithmic the white band is the sum of all the blue bands so it gives you kind of the big picture and yeah you'll notice that historically for monero's lifetime it has never been this low on volatility monero even like even back here early at the launch monero never had this low of volatility so um, you would say, like, just from technical analysis, just from Bollinger Band analysis, you would say that Monero is currently setting up um, to make a very large macro move. Um, now, this could continue trending like this for another six months, um, who knows, maybe even another year. But in a broad macro sense, this is telling you that, that Monero's, Monero's volatility is compressing and that acts like a spring and that um, new speculation rounds will emerge at some point here, probably within the next year. And we'll start seeing a, a large macro movement to one direction or the other. Um, obviously, you know, we think that direction is up. Um, here's Monero versus Bitcoin. You'll notice that we came down here and we almost, almost, almost tapped this very long lower standard deviation band. That's what this orange, um, this orange, the, the lighter colored orange band is. It's the, um, it's basically the lifetime lower standard deviation of every data point of every candle across the entire Monero history chart going back to launch, at least on Kraken. So um, that's like, that's a very, very um, big place to look for. Um, last year, when we were looking at the dollar index and trying to figure out where it was going to top, we were looking at the upper standard deviation, uh, the lifetime upper standard deviation of the Dixie to try and um, peg a good spot to think that that would be the top and, and it was like i mean it was spot on it was we'll show that later but it was really really useful so this right here um this came within uh let's see that came within about five percent the monero bitcoin ratio came within five percent of um of touching that so that's i mean that's really close it wouldn't surprise me if there was still another um, washout here i don't think that the um i don't think the pump is done i think that it's likely maybe Probably over the next week or so or a few weeks, there could be a cool off period, some maybe some washout, maybe some sideways trending. Maybe the chart's set up and 
and consolidate. And, um, and I think that it's likely, or let me rephrase. At the moment, I think it's possible that um, more likely than not that we'll get another move of altcoins, especially altcoins to the upside, probably maybe Bitcoin to like 50K, or at least it'll try to make another another higher high here when whereas altcoins um pump so they're going to try and keep monero out in the cold on that one that's what they always do that's 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 the history for the past let's just say two years now so it wouldn't surprise me if monero bitcoin ratio comes back down and actually fully touches this orange line here um this is territory to be picking up like if you've got bitcoin and you want to transfer that into monero this is like prime time to be doing that um would be would be around this uh touching this this lower line here um, Ethereum is doing a little bit better uh, in terms of you know the relative performance of Ethereum to Monero. Um, let's put the statistical summary on here as well to make it. Uh, let's go to the daily. No, how many candles would that be? Sorry, we gotta. This this particular script is dependent um, for it to give you the right answer. Um, somewhat depends on you um, making sure that you've got the smallest resolution that you can. That's 289 bars. Um, yeah, so we can go down to 12 hours probably. Uh, okay, anyways, so right now, like this is this is not the kind of action that you would really want to see on this asset, Monero versus Ethereum. Um, <clears throat> in reality, uh, we have cleanly, solidly broken down these lower standard deviation bands and they're already starting to curl under. I really hate to, to be the bearer of bad news here, but this is the kind of thing I would expect to come make a touch of these lower bands. And then for Monero uh, Ethereum ratio to continue trending down like that. And that would actually, that would be congruent with my theory that um, Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin uh, in this next bull market and probably gain market cap parity. Um, so the flipping, you know, is obviously the, the cheeky way to say it, but uh, market cap parity is probably more, more accurate, you know, because it might kind of just like gain some semblance of about the same market cap and then... Um, you know, and then maybe it reverses from there, or maybe it just totally crushes it and the flipping actually happens. I don't know. But I do think Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin significantly um, going forward. And um, and this chart would kind of like in terms of its relationship to Monero would, would kind of be a corroboration of that. It's a small point. You wouldn't like hang your hat on this. It's just one chart. But, um, you know, it, it it is one thing that we look at. So um, let's see. OK, the 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 price of Monero on Kraken relative to the shitcoin exchanges has been on the negative side for the past week. Um, this is not hugely negative. Um, we've seen significantly more volume happen. Uh, again, this is the volume adjusted um, price divergence chart, but the Monero price has been doing volume negative relative to Kraken for really um, since eh, for about a week, maybe we'll just say five days, eh, well, a week, five days, something like that. So um, yeah, just something to look at. Monero relative to shitcoins. Um, okay, so we're basically trending down here. Um, yeah, there's there's no head and shoulders on the uh, Monero relative to shitcoins chart right here. Um, and basically things are just like moving, following down this this red line. And I mean, that makes sense. Obviously, it's just like gold. When they pump new liquidity into the markets, when they take leverage, when they fake the markets, they don't pump it into gold. They don't put it into gold. They put it into um, highly speculative plays. They put it into uh, tech stocks and anything else, but they don't put it into a real usable, good, solid, sound money. Because um, they don't want you using a real usable, good, solid, sound money. Uh, they want you participating in degeneracy. So um, let's look at XMR.D. That's, I mean, basically, oops, XMR.D, not CD. Um, hmm. Something's got to be off here with this chart because this is not what I remember. Market cap dominance, Monero, crypto cap. It doesn't even have my lines. Where's like, oh, here we go. Okay. I was just on the wrong time frame. All right, so uh, yeah, guys, basically that head and shoulders that's invalidated. Um, as of as of the action of the past couple of weeks, there's no more head and shoulders here. We had talked about um, we talked about right here. We said, hey, we need to break this line. We need to confirm it, and we need to see things go like start moving to the upside. And that'll we needed the confirmation right here, and instead we got breakdown. So at this point, this head and shoulders is invalidated. Um, you you wouldn't be able to. You wouldn't be able to call that head and shoulders anymore. So that's really sad. That's really unfortunate. Um, fuck all the people that um, that fake these markets to such a to such a degree that um, prevents Monero from ever really seeing the spotlight. But hey, um, you know that's just that's just how the world works, guys. So um, you know maybe uh, maybe we'll get some other opportunities uh, going here in the future. 
Um, hopefully we got people in more and more converts, more and more converts. We're not a religion, more and more people that are, um, you know, that are hearing the news that are, that are interested in Monero that are actually going to be using it. So, but in terms of prices, Hey, you know, this is, uh, this is the situation that we're dealing with. So, um, uh, let's see, Bitcoin transactions. Um, the transaction fees actually come back down now. Uh, the median transaction fee is around $4. So, um, there might be some merit to say that, Hey, the RC twenties and ordinals and all this shit can't be like, it can't sustain the spotlight forever. Um, in Bitcoin and that at some point, uh, you know, that degeneracy has to die down. Um, so that's probably good news for, for the maximalist out there, but, um, they're, they're always going to run into this problem that when adoption waves happen, that's going to come with price pumps and price pumps are going to come with leverage and degeneracy. And so every single adoption wave is going to see their chain clogged up with people competing for degenerate gains, um, on monkey JPEGs and shit like that. And so they are always going to see muted adoption during big adoption waves um, because of um, the price points, because of the, the design, because of how easy it is to put arbitrary data into that chain. So, um, you know, that's that's and you're going to see this vacillation of the arguments between Bitcoin in the downtimes. They're like, oh, look, Bitcoin is usable. We don't need to raise blocks. And then in the uptimes, they're going to say, oh, look, good price, price, price is good. Um, and, and they're constantly going to vacillate between, between pretending like they don't have to do anything to fix their chain. Um, <laughs> there, there are some people to their credit. I am seeing some of the developers in Bitcoin, more and more of them, um, starting to talk about the things that really should have been done two or three years ago. And, um, like John Carvalho, for example, he had, a he had an interview, um, with, uh, John, uh, not John, I can't remember, Carallo, Matt, Matt Carallo. And I don't know why they would include Giacomo on there, but they did. Um, Giacomo doesn't know shit and he's not like really a developer. But anyways, um, like John Carvalho, for example, said the very last thing he said in this interview is, um, guys, please be more realistic, be less cheerleady. Um, he also said, I am I feel less magical regarding LN than I did a few years ago, um, you know, when, when, when we thought it was going to be able to do more. And so you're seeing a lot of Bitcoin devs, you know, and he, he also talked a little bit about a block size increase. He said, when the Bitcoin community, <laughs> if the Bitcoin community is ready for it. Um, so, I mean, the pain of what's happening now, I think could, could motivate some change here. We'll see. I not really, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet on that necessarily, but, but maybe, uh, okay, let's go to the Monero transactions. That's really why I came to this chart. Number of transactions per day. Uh, Okay, so Monero transactions, we're still above 20K. Um, we've moved from oscillating around 20K. It looks like we're basically um, bouncing off of 20K. All right, um, had a little Christmas bump there. I guess we're back to some kind of steady state now. Interesting. Uh, okay, so let's go to, let's, let's cover a little bit of the macro. We'll cover it quickly. Uh, we'll start with gold, I guess. So gold is, uh, gold got a little bit of a bump this week. Not much, you know, 1.2%. Again, gold does act in a lot of ways as a more stable money as a more stable asset. Um, so still in this long triangle, you know, not much has changed, but I mean, we are pressing towards the upside, right? Like this is, this is good action. The, the more that we do this instead of this, <laughs> uh, the better chance that there is that gold, um, gets the top side here and then, and then makes a, makes a break to the upside. I still, I'm still waiting for gold to make a breakout. Like, what's that? Someone have something? Okay, I guess not. Uh, just random noises coming from the internet at me. Okay, so what I'm still waiting for, like to be to confirm in my mind that a bull market, a real bull market, a sustainable um, pump, like real pump, is on the table. New all-time highs for crypto um, and continued running of of the Nasdaq. I am still waiting for gold to do this and then start its run up. I mean, I draw some squiggles, something like that, right? It, it could be something like this. Right. But I'm just waiting for gold to cleanly break its all time high and then start a macro move to the upside. That macro move to the upside in gold is our sign that a real bull market is happening um, in, in stocks and, and everything else. So uh, we'll still patiently be waiting that for that could be a month. It could be a year, um, but it's but it's coming. Uh, it's coming. Summer is coming for gold, gentlemen. Um, all right, we got to, we got the reverse repos here. The reverse repos continue to go down. Um, remember, we talked about last year at the rate that reverse repos are decreasing. This shit will be done by the end of January. Um, this shit will will fall down here and uh, and uh, and be and be finished by the end of January. At which point, you got to ask yourself, okay, what what kind of liquidity 
um, are they going to have um, to to sort of pump the markets? They'll have to find some new liquidity. Um, I guess with the current, so as of the past, let's just say, it uh, looks like about the past month, it slowed down some. Um, the 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 withdrawal of funds from the reverse repos has slowed down ever so slightly with this little spike here. Um, but in general, you would say that uh, that the reverse repos um, are looking about. I mean, maybe they'll extend this. Probably they'll extend this. They'll probably transition to something else. At this rate now, maybe it'll be March. But um, but I mean, that's coming, right? Like the end of the reverse repo um, pump liquidity is is coming at some point. So um, but it's it's not quite here yet. Um, dollar index is stable. Uh, I basically uh, it basically found support around the um, around the lower standard deviation area. Uh, you'll also notice that we have quite a long um, support line as well. Uh, that that just feels like a messy chart. Sorry for all the uh, the wave magic here stuff that's um, that's making the chart feel a little bit dirty, but uh, you know just uh, see through it. So um, okay, so this line right here, this guy right there. Um, basically, we found some support around the area, the neighborhood of that line. Um, one thing about dollar index I've noticed is that it does like to to like sort of make these little macro bumps outside of the line. Um, I'll sh I also told, uh, told you I'd show you guys the uh, the statistical levels on here. So we need to go to the daily chart for those to make sense. Um, but basically, uh, the dollar index, one way that we were identifying the top uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, was that it had broken the standard deviation levels and it was basically touching these purple bands. And uh, that level, like that area, was just a really solid area to expect to top. So um, right now, Dixie index, uh, dollar index seems stable. Um, I suppose it could break any way at any time, but um, it does feel a little bit biased towards the downside. Um, but things have run significantly here. The markets have run, NASDAQ has run, crypto has run. Um, it wouldn't be surprising for at some point here in the next month or so for gold to, to meander onto the top side here. Um, and maybe find some kind of compressing volatility uh, similar to, to how we talked about Monero. Because um, right now that's that's does this chart does look like that. Uh, the dollar index has compressing volatility. So it's it'll probably continue to compress a little bit more and then at some point make a macro move later this year. Um, it's 2024. And so like for the past, like the last cycle, um, 2020 was sort of a setup period you know you had a big washout um and then uh you know you sort of had like the setup grinding period and then things really broke out uh in 2021 um i mean really 2020 it also broke out that was the end of it so it, it, what i'm trying to get at here is that probably for some period at least for maybe the first half of this year there could be some grinding um in the markets there could be con some consolidation it could there could be some pullbacks um, maybe I wouldn't expect huge volatility um, and huge opportunities necessarily um, to develop just yet. Um, I would like to see a washout still. I've been saying that for a while, but um, who knows? Maybe that doesn't happen. They print so much money. Uh, maybe the corporations are all doing so good. There's so much liquidity that no washout shall be forthcoming. That, that, that's possible. Um, so, yeah, that's that's basically what the macro looks at. Uh, looks like. Let's see. Uh, we had uh, we had some inflation numbers. Uh, let's call them, quote unquote, inflation, quote unquote, numbers. Um, but at any rate, uh, they told us some things that, that they released some numbers. Um, and so it looks like the core inflation bumped down by like the tiniest ever little ditty amount. Um, right here. So at this moment, with the way that uh, the CPI and the PPI in blue, the way that these are behaving now, this is we've probably arrived at the sticky part of inflation. So um, one thing that uh, that some analysts have said is that yeah, the Fed will be able to get inflation down to say 4% or 3%, and they should be able to do that pretty easily. But getting it down to 2%, which is their alleged target, they're going to have a hard time getting there. It's like that last mile problem. Um, so you'll notice that, for example, the uh, the core inflation in orange is pretty high up here. For the last two decades, um, really, really three decades almost, core inflation has really been trending, trending along kind of this area, right? So just hovering above 2%. Um, really oscillating around two percent, and right now core inflation is sitting here at four percent. So, um, and it does look like a kind of uh, hiatus has has happened here on the inflation numbers, at least the officially reported inflation numbers, um, where inflation is not wanting to come down anymore. The core inflation is still sort of trending down a little bit, slowly, slowly, slowly. But I mean, what? Maybe by the end of 2025, it might get to three percent. But that's assuming that they don't have to go rescue some crazy problem with the markets, right? Which which could happen. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, inflation numbers, I wouldn't expect these to, I wouldn't expect these to come down much more. And as a result, I wouldn't necessarily expect the Fed to be looking at, um, at lowering rates anytime soon. So, but they, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe they'll do it. Uh, we can look at the, uh, the bonds really quick as well. Um, so yeah, bonds really not much has changed. We're starting to see the inkling of, uh, of the hope, should I call it hope? Do we really want this to happen? The inkling of the possibility that the, uh, the inversion of the yield curve might come back into the positive territory um, where overall this is, this is not inverted. So um, really the short end of the curve is still heavily inverted. I'm not quite seeing how these guys are gonna get down um, unless you just get you know that, that thing we're waiting for. If all of the yields start crashing, as this starts, as the inversion starts to correct back to normal, that's our sign, right? That's our sign um, that shit's about to crash. Protect your bags, but prepare to buy a shitload of um, of, uh, of risk assets. So, um, yeah, I mean, we and again, this flat top, this tabletop of rates right here, um, historically for the past two decades or more, that flat tops the rates all get under it, and then uh, and then you see like a big curl under. So. Um, that danger is still like, I mean, it's lurking out there in the abyss. Um, it's very plausible. It could happen at some point. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's just something, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a train wreck that you see coming five miles away and you're like, we can't stop these trains. It's going to happen at some point. Um, <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe they can stop the ship, you know, maybe they can, maybe they can stop the trains. I don't know. Um, but at, at the moment, this is starting to look a lot like the patterns that we've seen before. So we'll keep our eye on that. Um, we, we, we touch on it every week, you know, mostly just for any new listeners that are here. We, we want you guys to understand the macro picture, what's happening. Um, and then last, we'll just take a quick look at the stock market. Um, so basically, the NASDAQ um, is consolidating around its previous all-time high. This dotted line right here uh, is the previous all-time high from, uh, from back in 2021. So things are, it's oscillating here. Uh, it's probably going to continue following up this, um, uh, this channel on the upper side of this channel. Uh, or... Well, I say it's probably <laughs> actually. I'm not. I'm not confident about that. I'm not like really quite sure if it's going to continue um, following this sort of support lineup. It, it's possible this thing could just kind of come back into here, get back into the channel. I really think it should. Um, you know, it's it is an election year, and and there is no trick. There is no bullshit that they won't pull to try and keep people um, to try and keep people asleep and and voting, uh, going to the polls, regardless of who you're voting for, um, even if it's a libertarian. Um, you know, they'll try and keep you voting for. Or whoever, whatever they 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 want people, but they especially want to keep guys like Biden in power, right? Their little puppet. Uh, so, anyways, okay. There's the Nasdaq, um, and then the S and P is is flirting with its all time high. It's kind of like getting to that resistance area here. Um, it's interesting now. It's like the S and P seems to matter less and less. It seems like all eyes are on the Nasdaq, and I think it's because people know that markets always go up. So if markets always go up over long periods of time, why would I be in the S and P? Why wouldn't I get into the speculative uh, tech stocks, which yield, which give you better uh, better gains, better yields uh, over the course of time? So um, I, I think that dynamic is happening. Um, so, uh, oh, you know, there, okay. So, so that'll, we'll call it, we'll, uh, we'll call it good here for the macro stuff. Um, there was, there was one more thing that I wanted to show you guys and it's a, it's an instructive lesson. So it's something, um, it's something that I talk about markets learn. Like if you want to be a trader, if you want to do markets, if you want to understand this, you have to understand that markets learn. And a lot of the stuff that we talk about, even though you don't hear all the plebs talking about it on Twitter, I guarantee you that that there are people in the background. There's uh, there's family offices. There's smart money. There's insiders. There are guys that talk about this stuff, and and they understand. Um, and also other just random dudes out there, uh, random liquidity out there that that learns from the market. And so what happened here with the Bitcoin ETF is very instructive regarding that. Um, effectively, what we saw was. Um, was a little bit of a front running. Like, so for example, this ETH pump, um, I think that this was effectively like ETH pumped rapidly more than Bitcoin after that ETF was released. And I think a lot of that can be, um, can be attributed to the fact that um, we did see altcoins continue to run significantly after the last major financial inclusion for Bitcoin in the traditional financial system. Um, we, we saw a major altcoin push. So I think that, I wouldn't say it got front run, but in this case, Ethereum pumped like if the pattern was going to repeat exactly, Ethereum would have um, would have not pumped here. Uh, it would have waited a few days, waited a week, and then started um, pumping. You know, outperforming Bitcoin, but it outperformed Bitcoin the day, the moment that that news dropped. So that's kind of like a small example of how markets learn. Um, they see a pattern, people recognize patterns, and then 
people front run that pattern. And so markets will act sometimes earlier um, than you might think according to how the pattern was last time. So just a small little point there that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, and with that, I think that's about all I got for you guys today. Any any questions? Uh, I think you kind of already covered this, but Raffinus is asking, are we going to see 0. 0.003 again? 0. 0.003 again. Mm. Uh, so what do you think? You think the bottom is in with regards to the XMR BTC ratio? I would put I would put good odds on um, on coming down here one more time to see 0. 0.003. I, I would say that's that's probably a reasonable possibility. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. But that's also probably a, a reasonable opportunity to pick up some Monero um, because, you know, nothing moves in a straight line, even if Monero is going to continue going down versus Bitcoin. Um, this has been a quite a severe movement, and we should see, uh, we really should see at least a movement back to the large standard deviation area. So maybe it could look something like that, right? That's possible. Um, but I, I do think there's a reasonable opportunity that that um, the yeah, things come back down here to this area again. I say use that as in a technical sense, in a technical chart sense, that's an opportunity to buy Bitcoin. Um, or sorry, <laughs> that's an opportunity to sell your Bitcoin and buy Monero. When was the last time we were at 0 0.003 historically? It's been a while. Wow. Yeah, it's been since 2016. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, October, uh, August of 2016 was the last time that we were there. Hold the line, boys. Hold the line. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it is really annoying. And it's probably another reason that I, that I troll and shit talk Bitcoiners so much is because when we try to talk to them about Monero and the technical merits and the reasons why we should we should have been friends um, and we're not friends anymore. Sorry, Bitcoiners. Like it's just the simple facts. The the way y'all have conducted yourselves has made that impossible. Um, some of y'all, I make an exception for a few of y'all, but um, um, we should have been friends. But every time that that we talk to you guys about it, you just said, "Oh, well, you're just going to price die. Ha ha! Look at your shitcoin. Ha ha!" And you were really, really toxic, hostile people in general as as a group. Um, and then always pointed towards the price chart, even as you were simultaneously outperformed by shit like Soul, FTT, Cardano, and a whole bunch of monkey degen shit that's on your own chain now. Like, yeah. So um, even though we have problems with our price here, uh, <laughs> uh, I should say problems with our price. We have problems. I mean, we do have problems with our price. Like, let's be real. Like, the cabal did a pretty good job of um, of suppressing price in a lot of ways, and um, that does. That does move mindshare away. It does move interest away. It does move people that would otherwise have adopted and used Monero and given it a try to some other degenerate play. Um, it's an unfortunate reality of the world, but that's like of the financial world. But that's just how things work. Um, they've been doing this shit in the traditional markets for long periods of time, um, so they're they're pretty practiced at it. And at this point, um, I'm convinced that the cabal, the crypto insider cabal, is basically joined up um, with the financial insider cabal. So. Just know your enemy, guys. Like this is not a good situation. I wish our price was doing better. I wish our relative prices were doing better, but um, but it is what it is. So uh, we just got to make the best of it. Yeah, and I, we're obviously stronger than ever in every other metric, right? Um, yeah. But pr price, it's 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 hard. It's hard to see. obviously no, nobody knows. Nobody knows what's happening. Um, there's there's no way to tell. The other thing to realize is that. If Monero wasn't a threat, if Monero wasn't powerful, they wouldn't worry about it. They wouldn't spend the time doing this. They wouldn't. Um, they wouldn't do this relative price suppression. They wouldn't remove it from exchanges. They wouldn't lie about it. They wouldn't fractionally reserve it. They wouldn't do all of this. They wouldn't do any of it if it wasn't actually a threat to them. So um, right. the real the real takeaway here is like keep going, don't stop, um, and and keep building. Ignore ignore the ignore the price and yeah build build out the parallel economy right. Um, yep. you mentioned that, and sorry, cause I was distracted over here. You mentioned that you're expecting a big move with Monero given its, its recent volatility action. Yeah. Okay. So what we were talking about was, um, let's, uh, sorry, things are being, uh, delayed here on the charts. Oh, it's cause I have so much history here on it. Uh, okay. So. 
I know this is messy. I'm hoping you can see through it. Um, maybe I can turn off. Sorry, this will take just a second. The drawings. Okay, that hopefully that helps a little bit. So you can see in a big, in a large macro sense, the blue lines and the orange lines, the upper standard deviations and the lower standard deviations. You'll notice that they're compressing. Um, you'll notice that the blue lines are falling and that the orange lines are rising. So the distance between the top here and the bottom is getting smaller and smaller, right? So what we call that is compression, like in Bollinger Band analysis, you would call that a compression of the volatility, a compression of the Bollinger Bands, because in a way, that's what standard deviation measures. You're, you're measuring the volatility um, around, the, around the center point of an asset. So typically in, in technical analysis, what you would say is that as volatility compresses, as your Bollinger Bands compress, um, your price, that kind of acts like a spring, your price, and the theory on it, I believe, is that your price basically finds a stable point. Like everyone says, everyone basically agrees, okay, this is the fair price of the asset. This is where the stability price exists. And then at some point, after the market has, has felt good enough about where that price exists, where that price should be, some new round of speculation will emerge. And typically that'll be associated with some kind of macro events or, or like just a, a general broader move. But what you'll find is that after a large compression, a long-term compression, price will start making um, a macro move to one side or the other, right? It'll move one direction and it'll trend there for a very long time. Um, so in this case, obviously, uh, these, are, these are very long charts, these are very long bands. Um, this could continue pressing for another six months or come pressing for another six months uh, or a year maybe. But at some point, what you would expect to see um, is that price starts moving to one side of those bands. And for example, the blue bands, the, the upper standard deviations would eventually start to curl to the upside and then price would basically trend. Um, I don't know if y'all can see that. I think the, the Monero logo always gets in the way. There we go. Uh, hopefully y'all can see that. So yeah, eventually um, after some level of compression of price, just like finding stability, it will eventually move to one side or the other and it'll release that stored energy like a spring. Um, it's, I mean, I don't really like using analogies necessarily, you know, compression like a spring, et cetera, but that's the theory on Bollinger Bands. After you get some, some level of compression, um, you'll, you'll see a major move, a new speculative move to one side or the other. Um, and so that's what these blue lines are here. The blue lines, what, what, we're, what they're doing is just we're subtracting the upper standard deviation from the lower standard deviation. And that's what these blue lines are. And, and obviously, again, we're talking about the, the 100 day, the 500 day, the 1000 day, the, the 50 day. We're just overlaying all of them together. Um, and so these blue lines, and particularly the white line, the white line is the sum of all of the blue lines here. It represents the overall volatility of Monero um, in, a, in a macro sense. Basically, Monero has never been uh, this non-volatile in its history, in its entire chart price history. Um, it has never been this stable in its price. And we can, we can point at specific um, metrics to, to define that, to look at that. So um, what you will typically see here, uh, is that again, you'll, you'll see these lines, they'll continue falling. This represents a uh, lowering volatility compression. And then at some point, a macro move to the upside or the downside will happen and the volatility will increase. And all of these lines will do this again uh, until uh, a new speculative uh, top or bottom is found. So obviously, um, you know, I think at, the more like- at this, stage, at this stage, how would you assess the probability to whether or not that breakout will be up or down? Is there any- TA that can help you make that assessment as to whether or not it will be an up movement or a down movement? Um, really to tell. I would pro in this case, like I would probably go more with the fundamentals. So because these these lines are so long, like all of this is such long term stuff. Um, the fundament the fundamentals to me would be more important. And then furthermore, uh, the the so another fundamental fact about the macro situation is liquidity. And so if like Monero is going to move wherever the, the rest of the market moves, right? If crypto goes up, Monero is going to go up. Even if they don't pump money directly into Monero, it benefits um, like gold does from, um, you know, from the secondary secondhand hand-me-down liquidity for, that the other primary assets get. Um, so fundamentally, the Monero chart, like it, it almost doesn't matter what the technicals say, like, okay, it's going to go down, it's going to go up. Um, fundamentally, this chart should continue going up, and the compression of these volatility bands um, indicates that uh, that such a move is should be fairly powerful. Um, that such a move is is setting up, preparing. Uh, I guess from a TA standpoint, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't. I guess uh, you can you caught me out, Doug. I uh, 
I haven't really entertained the down thesis on a TA standpoint for Monero. I really have not done that. So I maybe I'll do that this week because I, I probably, you know, for, for all the, the shit I talk about, you know, entertain the opposite side of your thesis. <laughs> I really should at least give that a, a go here on the Monero chart. All right. Well, I, I don't mind the optimism. So, all right, buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stick around if you can, obviously. Yeah, yeah, I'll try and be around. We have some uh, some hot news topics. All, All right. right, yeah, I'll be ready to jump in and uh, talk some talk some shit. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks Let's a lot. Thanks, buddy.